Hi, welcome uh, to this uh, FA Safety Team program on being pilot in command. I'd also like to let everybody know that we have uh, some help tonight from the air traffic control, Mr. Uh, Matt Wells from uh, Meacham Tower is here. So he's going to help us with some ATC aspects of some things that we may be talking about today. I am thrilled to see younger faces out there today. A lot of times the uh, FA Safety Team seminars just seem to bring in uh you know a lot of older people and i'm glad to see some younger people coming in i see some cadet academy people uh with the hats and shirts on that's awesome uh i am a flight instructor i've been one uh, since my since i was 18. if i do the higher math that's about five years now i've been a flight instructor and full-time active since then uh very active in general aviation do a lot of seminars webinars love going to oshkosh i'll talk about anything has to do with aviation so my side job is I, I fly the A320 for American Airlines. So you people at, at the Cadet Academy, I'm happy to talk to you, mentor you, anything that you wanna come and ask me, please feel free to do that afterwards. So tonight, again, the topic is on being pilot in command. So has anybody heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Well, this is a quote that I said a long time ago that I wish I knew half as much now as I thought I knew when I first got my private license with my commercial, I thought, oh, I'm, I got my commercial, I got 250 hours, I got my, my CFI now, I'm, I know everything there is to know. What I have learned since then is immense. You know, I mean, that is what drives the Dunning-Kruger effect is the fact that when you first get into a field, you don't know how much there is to learn. And aviation is one of those that I think we all love so much because we are never going to learn at all. Uh, there's always so much more. Uh, anybody here of Vsauce on uh, YouTube? A couple of you, yeah. So here's, here's Vsauce on the Dunning-Kruger effect. In 1995, a man named MacArthur Wheeler robbed a bank in Pittsburgh. He was caught because his only disguise was lemon juice. He covered his face with it. He knew that lemon juice could be used as an invisible ink when writing on paper revealed by heating. And he knew so little about why that worked, and he knew so little about how cameras worked, that he assumed with extreme confidence that lemon juice could make him invisible too. Seriously. Wheeler is an extreme example and was the inspiration for the Dunning-Kruger effect. Novices, people unskilled in particular disciplines, will often overestimate their knowledge and abilities in said disciplines because they don't even know how little they know, how much more there is to learn. On the flip side, experts in particular fields will often underestimate their knowledge, have less confidence in their abilities, or think that everyone else has the same level of knowledge that they do. What drives the Dunning-Kruger effect is the fact that often, the more you learn about something, the more you realize just how rich and complex and overwhelming and full of as-of-yet unanswered questions it really is. And so that's kind of what we're talking about. Novices think they know a lot. And then as you learn how much there is to know, you think, oh my gosh, there is a lot more. And then as you get more experience, you kind of realize that. And an experience, that's sort of what drives the yellow stripe down our back. Uh, you know, for the more experience you get, the bigger the yellow stripe down your back. And what I mean by the yellow stripe is that you're a little bit more afraid to do things. And in aviation, a little bit of fear is okay. It's what makes us be safe. It's what makes us mitigate risks and hazards that we see. And again, I saw this on the, anybody on the Facebook, North Texas uh, Aviation, I saw someone posted this. It's a great aviation version of the Dunning-Kruger effect. And we're not going to get too much into math and, and science. And this, this class is a little bit more about the soft stuff, the decision-making, the things about which we have to consider to be a good pilot in command. Uh, but before we do that, let's do talk about the lift equation. And we'll talk about all of those factors. No, we're not going to do that. That's not what tonight's about. Just kidding. I could hear the collective clinch in the room. You know, I was like, no, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to do that. So you are taught all kinds of things. You're taught about the airplane, how it works. You're taught about regulations, weather, the things that we're tested on, uh, the practical tests, navigation, everything that we're, we're, we're taught, but we're not really taught how to be a great PIC. 
a good instructor, and of course there's a big revolving door of instructors these days, will teach you that. The new ACS is tailored toward talking about risk management. And so we look at all these different things and say, okay, what's the risk here? And we as pilots are mitigating risk. We as humans mitigate risk all day long. We see a hazard. You're walking down the street and on the sidewalk and you see a lip in the concrete. That's a, a hazard, right? What's the risk? In your head, you're processing, well, I could trip over that and fall and hurt myself, right? So how are you gonna mitigate that risk? Well, as I walk past it, I'm gonna lift my foot up a little higher. I'm gonna be a little more intentional. So thousands of times a day, we're mitigating risk. Just wanna take that skill and hone it and harness it and, and do a better job as pilots on doing that because the, the airplane accidents that we're seeing, and I'm not gonna throw statistics on the board, but I think we've all heard, it's not always the airplane breaking down that's causing the accident. It's, it's, it's something may go wrong, but the way the pilot handles it maybe didn't have to be an accident or the decisions that pilots are making uh, maybe not so smart. We see a lot of smart pilots doing dumb things and there's some external pressures we'll talk about. Uh, we have a lot of examples out there to look at that prove to us that smart people can do dumb things. I've done dumb things and I've been lucky enough to learn from them. So when I was hired by the airlines, it was TWA back in 1989. I had an interview and this poster was on the wall that said this. It said the most important wings on a plane are on the pilot. And they asked me in my interview, they said, what does this mean to you? And I thought, well, exactly that. It, wings on the airplane, they, they're gonna do what they do. They don't have a brain. The pilot does. The pilot is exposed to all of the things that are going to be hazards along the way that they have to decide, am I gonna go or not go? If I'm going to go, how am I gonna mitigate this risk? So it's the, it's the pilot, and that's what we're talking about, who's, who's not only causing most of the accidents, but who can prevent them too, by taking all of this seriously. The uh, regulation, as we know, 91.3, gives us the responsibility and authority, right? It says that we are the, uh, directly responsible for and final authority as to the safe operation of a flight. We know that. We've had that pounded into our heads, right? A lot of times. And we've also sometimes maybe succumbed to, and especially novice pilots, the voice in our ears from air traffic control, no offense, but they might intimidate a pilot into doing something they don't want to do. And so that's what we really need to be careful about uh, and, and know that we have the ultimate responsibility here. In an in-flight emergency requiring immediate action, the pilot can break any FAR, can violate any rule, can do whatever they need to do to meet that emergency in the interest of safety. That's a tool you should carry around with you. It's a, it, it, don't take it lightly and you know, try to avoid a delay by declaring an emergency. I declare an emergency before every takeoff just because it's me, <laughs> but <laughs> don't take advantage of that. Use it when you need it and know that you can. We're gonna talk about declaring an emergency as well because a lot of pilots are very hesitant to do it. They're really intimidated to declare an emergency when needed. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. The uh, AIM also says the same thing that it gives us that authority and responsibility. So that's also in the AIM and it's in all of the aviation manuals that we've been reading as well. <clears throat> so, who is the pilot in command of the airplane? Well, you've got to be legal to fly the airplane, qualified, current. And what if there's two of you in the cockpit? There's, the B is the big one that sometimes comes into play because we have to designate who's pilot in command before the flight. So if I am flying with, let's see, who's a private pilot? Private pilot, how many hours you got? 2,200 hours, that's good. That's a lot of time. And are you a commercial? So working on it, good. Private pilot, 2,200 hours, ATP, and I'm not competing here. I just wanna say you and me are in the airplane, you're taking me up for a ride and you're 172 and I'm an ATP with 22,000 hours. Who's PIC on that flight? It's your airplane, you're taking me for a ride. So we designate, okay, I'll be PIC and you tell me I'm PIC and we brief it. Okay, your emergency happens, you're gonna handle it. Let's say we have a runway incursion. And now the FAA is gonna come talk to us and say, okay, which one of you two is PIC? And they're gonna take a hard look at the guy with the CFI, double I, MEI, ATP, 20,000 hours. Insurance company might do the same thing. Uh, we're, all, we're both gonna to point to each other, right? You're gonna to point to me and I'm gonna to point to you. 
and we're gonna, <laughs> and, and it's gonna land on me. So if you're the more experienced of the two, that's, that's where uh, um, it really is important to establish who's gonna be PIC and, and maybe even leave something behind on the ground with an FBO or the club that you're renting from or somewhere in the hangar on the whiteboard, just put who's PIC and leave that behind. In charter flying and professional flying, that needs to be designated and it needs to be left and, and uh, annotated on the ground somewhere so that we know who to get in trouble, right? But not only that, it keeps us a little bit more responsible in the cockpit. It's like having two master chefs in a kitchen. You know, who's gonna handle it? This is something to brief beforehand. And brief, you know, I, I've been up in an airplane that I'm flying, I'm pilot in command, but the person I'm flying with has 10 times as much time in that airplane as I do. And so I brief them, look, I'll be pilot in command here, but let's not fool ourselves. If we have an engine failure, I think you're the one that needs to put it down in the field because you'll do a better job. So these are the kind of things that need to be briefed and discussed ahead of time. And it's okay to talk about that ahead of time. Odds are just talking about it is gonna keep it from happening. So one time I had to say no to a passenger and this is, this is the toughest thing I think when you get your private and, and, we're, and, and this is where the ACS is driven toward nowadays creating scenarios because it's the scenario that we fail. It's, it's, it's in the scenario that we see accidents happen. For example, let's say you only got two hours of sleep last night and you're going on a long flight today with your family and everything. Should you fly? Now, I see a lot of people shaking their heads saying no. And here in the classroom or in the hangar, that's real easy to say. But in real life, we get out to the airplane. Eh, I got my second wind. I'm okay. It's VFR. I, and so we justify it. The decision that you all in the hangar have decided that you'd make out in real life, we tend to talk ourselves out of that. And that's the external pressures that we talk about. And so one time when I was one of my first flying jobs back in college and flying a Piper Arrow, captain on a Piper Arrow, and that's a, a four seater single engine in case anybody doesn't know. And we're going from uh, Carmel Valley to, and this is, you know, talk about saving your job. I had a fork in the road, Carmel Valley up to San Jose, California. Uh, Carmel Valley, is anybody familiar with that airport here? I know we're in Texas, but it's just, a, I'm gonna show you a picture of it. Uh, small, unimproved, rough runway. It's like 25, there it is right there on Google Earth. It's in a little bit of a valley and it was hot. It was like 90 degrees, not a lick of wind. And, and so we got hills at each end and it's a tough airport to get in and out of on a good day. Well, my passengers show up with all kinds of heavy boxes and crates. So there's me, even though I weighed less than, and two other men and a bunch of boxes, heavy boxes and crates wouldn't fit in the airplane. There's no way, but they wanted to get as many as they could. How many can we bring? So I'm like, okay, and I'm 21 years old and I'm thinking, uh, you know, this is a great job. I love this job. I wanna try and make this work. So I pull out the Piper charts, spaghetti charts. Anybody seen those? The takeoff distance charts, density altitude. And I am, I got that on the wing. I'm looking at the manual. I'm trying to figure out how much runway I need, what the climb is gonna be like, because I'm not feeling good about this. And the passenger is just looking over my shoulder and he's not a pilot. And he's yelling at me saying, we just did this last week. I'm getting all this pressure. I remember to this day, seeing the sweat dripping off of my forehead onto those spaghetti charts, trying to figure out the performance. Of course, it landed right where I needed to see it, faded it out. You know, that's exactly how it works, right? So I said, I don't like this. Why don't we go to Monterey? I fly the airplane to Monterey and you drive there. Monterey has a long field, long runway. It's, it's right next to the ocean with a coastal breeze, cooler temperature, no obstacles, but ocean for like thousands of miles. So if I can get a foot into the air, I can do what I have to and get going. But I'll fly the airplane to Monterey. You guys drive over there and I'll meet you. It's a five minute flight for me is about a 25 minute drive for them. And they didn't like it, but the one of the two was a little bit more calming. The one was yelling at me and, and he was just really not wanting to do it because we just did this a few months ago. Well, it was winter and cool and, 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 I, and, and that's not me. You know, maybe they took off over gross and lucked out. I try not to do that. Well, 
You may have heard of my boss at that point. This was my passenger. I don't know if you're familiar with him or the company that he started in his garage with Wozniak, but Steve Jobs was my passenger. And if you've seen the movie with Ashton Kutcher, has anybody seen that? Where he plays Steve Jobs? I'm just gonna give you an example. And I'm showing this only so that you know what this passenger was like. Well, how he treated me was exactly like this. So when I saw this movie, and I saw Ashton Kutcher, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got the heebie-jeebies just from watching it, because this, this is exactly what he's like. So a little external pressure there. And, you know, I've always said since then, don't fly or work for a company that you're afraid to get fired from. And I just said, no, we're not doing it. Okay, I'm standing up. This may be my last flight for you, but it's going to be to Monterey. I'll pick you guys up or not or you can drive all the way to San Jose if you want. This is how it's going to be. And I held my ground and did it, and I felt pretty good about that. But I figured, you know, this is, this is going to be the end of it. So I get called in to, when we land in San Jose, we land safely. Now, by the way, when we took off out of Monterey, I picked them up, we loaded the airplane up. I might have kept the airplane on the ground like a long time on purpose. <laughs> rotated really shallow, climbed very shallow, to, just to give them the impression that, have we been, just picture this out of that other airport, right? So they got to do that. He's pictured that. I thought maybe that'll have an effect and maybe he'll understand. I don't know if it did or not. But when I got there, I'm putting the airplane to bed and the blind guy comes up to me and he says, yeah, Markala wants to see you in his office. Now, Mike Markala is the number three employee at Apple. He's the one who gave Wozniak and Jobs their money to get their little idea going. He, of course, ran the, the flight up, owned the flight operation. So I went up there and it was just like a movie. You know, I walk into his office. He's on, he's on the phone and he's like, have a seat, close the door. You know, just like that, just like you'd see in a movie. And I'm sitting there going through all of the arguments in my head. You know, like when you're home, you're late for dinner and you're going through all the arguments that you're going to give whoever's making you that dinner, right? I had it all ready. And so he gets off the phone and he floored me with the first question that he asked me. He said, Brian, what are we paying him? I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Wasn't ready for that one, but I told him. And his comeback floored me as well. And he said, all right, well, anybody who's willing to stand up to Steve Jobs the way you did, we want working for us in the interest of safety. And so he doubled my pay. He said, we're going to double your pay. I thought I was getting fired. I got my pay doubled. And so I showed you a picture of a fork in the road. Had I gotten fired for making that decision back on that day, that might have had an influence on my downline decision making. Right, like I got fired once and now maybe I need to rethink that. I, how many jobs can you lose before you start? But they rewarded me for doing the right thing for the interest of safety. And, and so that had a profound effect on the rest of my flying career. I'm not afraid to do the right thing. And again, don't be afraid to get fired from anywhere you're gonna work in the interest of doing the right thing. You know what's right. So getting, getting get their itis is, is the thing that we've heard of and that's what we succumb to we want to get home. We want to get our people where we're going, or we're going for a wedding, or we're taking the family to a New Year's party, and we're leaving New Year's Day. Well, you got to fix that and, and ameliorate, you know, ameliorate? Is that a word? Is that, when well, you want to reduce the pressure, leave a day early. Find a way to make it so that you're, you have room for things to happen and have a plan B, of course. Now, whenever I fly with a co-pilot or a student in a small airplane, I tell them, that there are three criteria, do whatever you want when you fly the airplane, but I want you to adhere to these three criteria in this priority order. The first being, do whatever you want as long as it's safe. Do whatever you want as long as it's legal. And do whatever you want as long as it's comfortable. Come on, I'll move the mouse. Comfortable for the passengers. Airlines, general aviation, it doesn't matter. If you have to break one of these, start at the bottom chip away at the bottom of that list in priority. We, you know, if you have to ev ev evasively fly the airplane to avoid hitting another one, do you care if it's uncomfortable for the passengers? No, that's the time to take away number three, but we wanna stick with number one. And on that note, I'm just gonna say, because it popped into my head, a midair scares me, especially with our heads down devices that we have today. So I'm just gonna say, as long as you've got your head in the cockpit, constantly be thinking, okay, get my eyes out the window every few seconds, okay? This was another external pressure situation, right? Kobe Bryant, anybody not heard of that accident? 
Kobe Bryant, helicopter pilot, not instrument rated, scud running out in California. But not only was he scud running uh, under the clouds with hills, he was doing it very fast speed because the boss was in a hurry. The boss is in a hurry, so that doesn't make me in a hurry. And that's one of the reasons we have safer operations at airlines and charter operations than we do in general aviation, one of them. Granted, we have a lot of tools at our disposal, but one of the things is that we're removed from having a vested interest in the arrival at a certain time. As an airline pilot, I don't care if Sally in row 15 has a wedding they're trying to make it to, or there's a basketball team back there that's got a game tonight. I don't care, that doesn't run into, I shouldn't say I don't care, I do care, but it doesn't affect my decision-making. We don't get there on time, we don't get there on time because I've, you know the airplane's broken or something unsafe I don't like, I'm gonna sacrifice the on-timeness uh, and without having a vested interest in the arrival. So how can general aviation pilots do that? Well, you take your inner passenger and put them in the back seat. Just visualize it. Take your inner passenger, put them in the back seat, or the, if it's full, put, put your inner passenger in the cargo compartment, either way. But you are now the pilot responsible for a safe operation. It, if you get there on time, you get there on time. At this point, you just need to do what's right. There was another one, <clears throat> excuse me, so what we're talking about is the E in the PAVE checklist. Who's heard, not heard of the PAVE checklist? Pilot aircraft and environment and, and external pressures. So the E in the PAVE checklist is external pressures and it's a very real thing, probably the most dangerous thing. If you see an airplane with a flat tire, can you go? No, I mean, you, if you have a big rudder and a lot of power, maybe, but you're not going to, it's obvious, you know? Um, if you're sick, got a broken arm and you're in the hospital, can you go? No, sometimes it's obvious with the pilot and the aircraft. Environment at zero, zero outside and you're not instrument rated, you're not gonna go, it's obvious. But the external pressures, rarely is it obvious. And so you've got to take a good hard look at why am I deciding what I'm deciding. And as far as, far as deciding goes, making a decision, even if it's wrong, is better than not deciding and being wishy-washy. And I love this one, I just have that hanging up in my office. So the external pressure, it influences the safety of flight. It, little, flight. it literally is pressure and you feel it. And, and I think who here, show me your hands if you've ever felt any kind of external pressure to complete a flight. Yeah, most of us. Has anybody felt that pressure, taken the flight anyway and then regretted it afterwards? Yeah, <laughs> crazy, right? I hope we learn something from that. So when we luck out, we learn from it. We say, I'm never going to do that again. I ferried a 310 across the country one year uh, against everything I should have that should have stopped me. I just kept going because the owner really wanted the airplane. He, he really wanted it there. Well, okay. Well, then obviously I should do what's dangerous, right? But I did a lot of things that scared me and I learned from it because I was lucky. And now I won't ever do that again. Hopefully, some of you can make that decision and maybe learn that lesson force yourself to before you do something foolish. And another case in point, this was a while ago, but JFK Jr. flying out to uh, Martha's Vineyard, reduced visibility with the no horizon out over the water. They left later, he's not instrument rated. Same thing, wife and, uh, and sister-in-law had to get there, had to get there and they made him late. You have to tell your pastors, you made me late. I'm not comfortable flying now, we're not going. And be proud of that. Some of my best flights are ones that never took off because they were safe. And it could have been catastrophic had I done it. Avianca 52, anybody familiar with that? We've studied this in a lot of accident case studies. Uh, it's an airliner, ran out of gas going into JFK. And rather than talk about it, I'll give you a brief video. World News Sunday, here's Forrest Sawyer. Good evening. We begin tonight in... And the crash of the Avianca airliner, which killed 73 people on board. It seems unbelievable that it could have run out of fuel, but it did. And today, we know why it did. Investigators have added up the figures of fuel on board and time in the air, and they spell disaster. Here's Robert Haig. New calculations by investigators make it appear it was inevitable that the Avianca plane would run out of fuel. Papers found in the wreckage today confirm that the flight plan 
called for about 10,000 gallons of fuel to be loaded at takeoff in Colombia. 10,000 gallons is less than half of a 707's absolute capacity, but commonly airlines don't weigh down their planes with more than what's considered prudent for safe flight. In this case, about three quarters of the 10,000 gallons would be needed for a direct flight to New York, leaving 2,500 gallons in reserve, enough to fly 90 minutes in case of delays. Investigators now say there were three delays due to bad weather, one over Norfolk, Virginia for 16 minutes, another over New Jersey for 27 minutes, and a final one over New Jersey for 46 minutes. Total delays, 89 minutes, using up almost all the 90 minutes worth of reserve fuel. But investigators also understand the Avianca pilots did tell air traffic controllers their reserve fuel was low 45 to 50 minutes before the crash. The National Transportation Safety Board's Lee Dickinson. We want to find out which controller that was uh, given that information, how that information was passed on from controller to controller, and that's the type of information we're looking for. Tonight, investigators say they feel one issue in the crash is communications, failure of the pilots to communicate the true urgency of their fuel situation, communicate that to controllers, but failure of controllers, too, to communicate with one another as the plane neared New York that this was a plane with a potential fuel problem. Garrick? Well, Bob, if the controllers knew there was indeed a fuel problem, why didn't they bring that plate in earlier for a landing? Well, Garrick, in bad weather, controllers get used to hearing a lot of complaints from pilots. The controllers are very busy to start with. Uh, they're not, some pilots are not above a trick or two to express, express a mild concern about fuel in order to get out of a holding pattern and jump the line. So I think the feeling is if you want to get the controller's attention well, uh, you've got to do something like declare an emergency. That would do it. Thanks, Bob Hager. So we talk about an air traffic control is mentioned in that. Could we discuss this for just a second? Why, <laughs> why didn't air traffic control bring that aircraft in sooner? Oh man, what year was this? Before you were born? Were no, you? no, it was before. It's pretty close though. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, so I mean, when so, a pilot tells you they're low on fuel, what does that mean to you? Uh, means you shouldn't be loitering around in the air. Of course, uh, who, who in here has flied, flown big jets and stuff? Okay. You don't count. I don't think Small airplanes. Yeah, who's pilots in here? Okay. So, okay. So who has any complaints about controllers first off? <laughs> you guys can't come to meet them, right? The rest of you guys come to the pattern. When I hear low fuel, any kind of this scenario, of course, you know, you're flying Pipers, Cessnas and stuff. I... I personally don't play. I have literally run an airplane down to, well, it wasn't me. I wasn't PIC, and I learned a lot of lessons that day, but it was uh, 15 or so minutes of gas left. Nice IMC night, lots of, uh, lots of lessons learned on that night, uh, but um, that lesson set the way for the rest of my flying. I normally will fly with, everyone knows uh, who's IFR in here, you know the minimum requirements to the destination, alternate, plus or minus, or, or plus one, okay. I don't do that crud, I double that especially if I'm flying IMC, and I double it again if I'm flying with family. So when I, as a controller, I'm a pilot too, by the way, sorry. I fly, I fly airplanes. Are oh. all, all controllers pilots? No, 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 no. <laughs> I work with about two or three pilots at Meacham Tower. Um, one of them's not active anymore. One of them says he is, you know. Uh, I am an active pilot, you know. Uh, I fly out of an aero club up here at Denton, and I like airplanes. I fly a 182 most of the time. It holds six hours of gas. I love it. Six hours? Who can hold their bladder that long? <laughs> Nobody. If you right. can now, you won't. You yeah. Know. Or little Johnny. Little Johnny? No? Okay. Anyway, when I hear that as, as ATC, which in the smaller GA community, I have, I think I've heard that maybe once or twice in my time uh, here at Meacham. It's a former military controller. I used to control F-22s and all that in the bag of chips. Those guys didn't play around with their gas either. So when those guys said they were low on gas, hey, look, there's the runway. Go ahead and land. Didn't argue. For the GA guys, I don't even argue. Now, luckily, most of the flight schools where I control at, they have a similar mindset and policy on fuel. So if they, if they actually come back and they're like, yo, we're low on gas. What do you need? Oh, there's an airport over there. You want to go land at the Navy base? I don't care what you need. Get on the ground. Who's afraid to land that Navy? <laughs> what if you're out of gas? Okay, no, that's what, that's, yeah. So if you're out of gas or if you had an emergency, who cares? At least you're around to do the interview, right? Yeah, exactly. So 
I hear low fuel. If you if you came into Meacham, okay, and I'm working you know the tower, then you come in, you're like, hey man, I'm here and I want to go here and uh, I'm low on gas. I would just continue eating my Chipotle and Mountain Dew. I thought, okay, what do you want from me? Leave me alone. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do it. <laughs> I would I would say, okay, cool. You know, what do you want to do? Do you need to come straight in? Do you need to go to a downwind? What do you want to do? Most of the time, it's going to be a, you know a downwind or a straight and whatever is appropriate for the winds. That doesn't mean anything to me as a controller. Does anyone know what means something to me? There's a, there's a few different words. Huh? Who said mayday? Mayday. mayday. You said mayday. Mayday. You had a fourth light. Uh... <laughs> you got mayday, pan pan. Anything else? Minimum fuel. There we go. What does minimum fuel mean? Does anybody know? Can I make you do circles in the downwind if you say minimum fuel to me? Yes, I can. All dang day. Minimum fuel. Okay. Make a ride 360. Get a good look at the stockyards for me. <laughs> minimum fuel to a controller means no undue delay. Now, I'm not going to circle you and just <laughs> control our amusement. No. If I have to delay you for some reason, I can do it. I can 100% legally do it. Will I do it? No, because I'm a pilot and I know where that can lead to. But some controllers might. Some controllers might because not all controllers are pilots and not all controllers like their job like I do. Oh, by the way, these are my words and not the views of the FAA, okay? <laughs> Let's keep that real clear. Yeah, somebody, some people do that. You're going to get controllers that they don't give a credit. What's the other word that you could say besides minimum fuel? <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> What's that? Isn't that a game? Bingo. So I don't know that, that one. That's over the church over around the corner. They're playing that right now. Bingo. <laughs> B25. No. No. Anybody else know? There's a, there's a, it starts with one word that starts with a D. There's one that starts with an E. Declaring an emergency. Bonus points to you. Uh, declaring an emergency to me means you don't have enough fuel to get to the runway, which I really, really hope that we're wrong, but you're going to get whatever I give you. I don't personally play with that stuff, but let's assume for a minute if uh, that I'm a controller that's not like loving my job. Or a pilot. Or a pilot that likes, likes controlling or flying. I do both. I love it all. Let's just say that, you know, you got me on a bad day. My Chipotle's late. You know, I don't have a Mountain Dew. And I'm just not in a good mood. I really like this thing. Sorry. And you come in, you're like, hey, I'm in fuel. And I'm like, okay, what do you want? And I'm serious about it. I do work with people that are that way. And then you're like, yo, I need to come straight in. Don't keep up and say that's a tower, set a call sign, you know, do the right thing. Um, <laughs> seriously uh and they still they're like okay what do you want you know you're I, I not to go in too far and deep to it but who who has called tower or a controlling agency hey tower cessna and that was it anybody yeah you're laughing your butt off in the tower i'm going crazy i call it a cold call i absolutely hate it because it doesn't tell me anything and it wastes my frequency time and when i'm busy with six planes in the pattern and everybody else trying to go in and out, I, what do you want from me? I don't know. So if you get a controller and you're coming in and min fuel or you know, whatever the emergency may be, fuel especially, because it can turn into an emergency, just say so. Hey, I need to come straight in. You declaring? Sure. Did you know ATC can declare for you? Yeah, we do it all the time for fun. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but we can. I could, I've declared for, I don't know how many planes over my, I don't know how many years I've been doing it, 13 years, 13 years now I've been controlling. I've declared for so many airplanes, it's not even funny. You know why? Who of you are scared to declare? Ooh, paperwork. Is that why? Is that why? Paper, you're the only one that raised your hand. You're brave. Paperwork. Would you rather be allowed to do paperwork or not? It's... So, so the most that'll come out of an emergency for air traffic is I got I got a little I got to do a report. That's it. For I've never had to do it as a pilot. But the most that comes out of it is you're alive enough to do whatever that, comes after it. Yeah, Phone call or report or whatever. It's not a big deal. It's a tool in your hip pocket, right? Not to be abused. Right. Exactly. But you say what you need to do. You say what you need to say to get on the ground. If your fuel calculations off, everyone fly the old Cessnas with the freaking uh, the little needle does it. Yeah, she's laughing. She knows. <laughs> Nobody. Yeah, you're like. I've I've flown one or two that those those were not accurate and you know, they should never be. You know, I had a fuel flow monitor, but whatever. Those things, I have one that was like all the way on E and I'm like still running on that tank. I'm like, how much longer do I got? You know, and I wasn't, I had still had plenty of gas. I was just doing some testing by myself, VFR day, no winds. I was up high and 
Yeah, don't trust the fuel gauge. <laughs> yeah, that still so goes on. I can play. I know. I, you know, <laughs> fuel gauges are good slip skid indicators too. Because if you're less than full tanks, you can do a slip and a skid. You can watch them do this. Watch it sometime. You'll see. It's a good way to coordinate yourself if you, if, you, if your ball fails. But I'll show. I'll play a video of what, uh, an emergency, a fuel emergency that went a little bit differently. And I'm going to skip past that one. And so this is one that happened a little bit differently at JFK. And this is how it should go. You might seem surprised or shocked by it, but this is how it should go. And maybe you've seen this. And that's going kind of quickly, but just suffice it to say, uh, a, an airliner, American 767 was landing. The winds weren't good, wanted another runway, been vectored around too much and was getting critically low on fuel. American 2 Heavy, 2 to left, you clear to land? Clear to land. 2 to left, your, your localizer is not iron. Okay, I will double check it. American 2 Heavy, I just reset it, it should be coming back up in a little while. Wind now 32023, gust into 35. American 2 2, uh, we can't land on uh, 2 2, uh, we're breaking off the approach, and if you don't give us to uh, runway, uh, 3-1 right, we're going to declare emergency. All right, I'll pass it along. Fly runway heading for now. Okay, we're declaring emergency. We're going to land 3 one right. We're going to go left <laughs> and then we're coming around. American 2 Heavy, just fly runway heading. Clear the area. Okay, you're saying you're declaring emergency at this? Three times I've told you that. Three times we're declaring an emergency. Okay, I just want to verify. I know you told me if you didn't get 31 right, you would have to declare emergency. Okay, understand. Fly runway heading, but i got to get you a turn. No, we can't. Jeffrey 62, the left on Alpha and monitor the ground to the ramp. That's Alpha, I'm on the ground, Jeffrey 62. Tower, check control, 50 ILS, 22 left. Chris Merkin, uh, 2243, Finley Tower, hold short. I head in 180. You know what, American 2 Heavy, uh, we are turning around to the left here and landing on 3 1. Remove everybody from our way. We've declared an emergency. We're on a visual. All right, American 2 Heavy, 3 1 right, clear to land with 3 1 0 2 4, gust in a 3 4. Thank you. Clear to land on runway 3 1 right, American 2 Heavy. Cactus 12, maintain 2000, cancel approach, clearance. So you see how that went. When you declare an emergency, you get what you want. It's a tool to keep in your hip pocket. When you're not getting something you need or you need some help, that's what you do is you declare an emergency. And in this case, the controller was trying to sequence some traffic around, and that pilot felt compelled to turn downwind right now and go land the airplane. And kudos to him because he may have ran out of fuel and been that, the next Avianca. So you do what you have to do. Get on the ground and deal with the consequences later. Uh, don't be afraid to get fired. Don't be afraid of the FAA. If you declare an emergency and you're doing something in the interest of safety, please don't hesitate to do it. There was a Piper Arrow uh, on the East Coast several years ago. AOPA has a great safety uh, reenactment of this, but it, this guy is over Dover, Delaware, did a missed approach at his destination, couldn't get in, went to his alternate, two approaches there, couldn't get in there because of the weather or because it's trouble flying the RNAV approach. He's diverting to a third alternate after three approaches, after a four and a half hour, five hour flight in a Piper Arrow, and he's flying over Dover, Delaware Air Force Base, looks down and says, hey, can I land there? Controller says, no, unless it's an emergency. He goes, oh, okay. So he keeps going and he's critically low on fuel. Flames out, engine fails. He says, I'm declaring an emergency, mayday, mayday, mayday. I need to go back to Dover now. The time to declare an emergency is when things are dire, not, you don't have to wait for the engine to quit because of that low fuel. And he was right over that runway and could have just sat down in there. So no, unless it's an emergency. It was very sad to hear that because all he had to do was say, this is an emergency, I'm landing there, and you get on the ground. Your survival instincts should kick in. And one of my good friends just texted, he said, anxiety is nature's way of saying you've already screwed up. <laughs> if you think about that, you've gotten yourself into a position you shouldn't be in. So I like that. I'm gonna give you two secrets. So, so I've studied a lot of accidents. One of the things I do is, is, is as an expert witness, uh, testifying in litigation after an accident. So I look at it real closely with a very objective eye. I get to see a lot of details that many people don't get to see. And I see a couple of de common denominators. 
One of them is getting outside the envelope. And I don't mean literally in an envelope. What do I mean by inside the envelope? Well, we have this bad area, okay? Red is bad, right? And, and green is good. What do you think defines the envelope in which we fly? Can you just shout out some answers? Safety is a, a paramount, but because we are not capable of being safe on our own, we have some things to guide us along the way. POH, what's that? Checklist, we have, yeah, a lot of resources. Uh, I'll, I'll populate the first couple, right? Three miles for VFR, you know, 1,000 above, 500 below, 2,000 horizontal. We get all these parameters in the regulations and the aim gives us a lot of guidance on how prudent pilots should operate their aircraft. We have the, the flight manual, advisory circulars, insurance might even dictate that we don't fly an airplane unless we have so many hours or we don't go into dirt fields. Rental agreements might do the same thing. Almost every accident that I've seen, one of these gets crossed. Someone goes outside the line there. And if you treat these as though they're gospel, you're gonna eliminate about 90%, I'm estimating, a very large percent of all the causes of an accident. And do you have to use exactly three miles as your basis to fly or not? What happens when you guys are calling the visibility three miles? Is it always exactly three? No. It could be maybe two point something, but they want people to be able to fly in the pattern. I don't know if they do that, but it's possible. But do you have to use those numbers? No, we can actually build in our own little safety margin. We can use five miles. And as a student pilot, your instructor probably gave you, any student pilots in here? Uh, yeah, all of us. <laughs> Anybody not yet a private pilot? And are you of you, how many have soloed already? A good number. That's great. That's awesome. Any restrictions placed on when you fly, when you can go solo? Yeah. It's okay to keep doing that throughout your entire flying career and decide what's a good safety margin for you and what's not. Uh, I still do it. I still have certain things that I, you know, conditions under which I won't fly. Mine are a little bit more stringent and, and that you've heard of personal minimums. And those are worthless unless you've written them down and told somebody about them. Right. It's it's like, what did I eat today? I didn't have a cheeseburger. But if I write down everything I eat, I'm a little bit more accountable. If I have someone else watching that activity or that action, then I'm even more accountable. So a good thing would be to use your favorite flight instructor and say, here are my personal minimums. If you ever see me violating these, let me know. Smack me around. Anyway, it's a good technique, but we'll all, we'll all talk ourselves into violating these personal minimums if there's a get their itis involved. So just some good advice, a good pilot in command, know the aim and the FARs, knows the, know the airplane, procedures, normal and emergency. As far as emergencies go, after your training, how often do you look up your emergency procedures in the manual? Some of us may, some may not. A good technique, every time you go flying, look at one emergency procedure before you go up in the air and just get familiar with it. If you have an engine fire, you should know before without even picking up the book, there are certain things. We don't have memory items, but we have memory items. You know, we have the mother of all memory items, aviate, navigate, you know, communicate last. Yeah, so we know that. What's the first step in an engine fire? You're flying along, you see flames coming out your cowling. What's the first step, anybody? Yeah, well, turn, <laughs> yeah. The, the, it's different in different handbooks. Sometimes it's the mixture, sometimes it's the, the fuel cutoff, but you wanna know, know that right away. You wanna get to that. So study your emergency procedures, just one every time you go flying. Know the limitations of your airplane. Again, that's part of the envelope that I'm wanting you to stay in. Uh, avoid risk stacking. You know, it's not the first Jenga thing that pulled out. It's not the first risk you take that gets you. It's the last one, right? It's a cumulative thing. It's the accident chain, the Swiss cheese model, however you want to look at it. But it's that last one is the one that caused it. So just don't take any risks. Don't take any pieces of wood out of the stack of Jenga. Avoid quandaries. Don't get yourself into a corner. You know, don't paint yourself into a situation you can't get out of. It's uh, you're, you're going in the clouds. It's, there's a freezing level about the same as the bases. Is that okay? Well, is the MEA below the base of the clouds? Can I get out of it? These are things to look at. Leaving yourself an out is very important. And of course, managing all the resources that you have. Uh, anybody that goes flying without a briefing, whether it be electronic, 
a quick glance at, at four flight or whatever, it, it's foolish. You just never know. Use your passengers, get them to help you spot traffic, uh, give them tasks, uh, verbalize your intentions. Hey, you see these taxiways are marked. It doesn't even have to be a pilot in the right seat. You're flying along and you tell your passenger, when we get to the street called B, <laughs> Bravo, I'm gonna turn left on taxiway Bravo. You've just enlisted them to back you up and not, and not miss that maybe. Hey, you said you were gonna turn here, okay. So when you fly in a multi-crew aircraft, Verbalizing your attention is really good because you're enlisting the other pilot. Now, let's say you're an instructor and a student. That is a situation, I'm sorry, student learner, learner. We don't have students anymore. An instructor and a learner together in an airplane. Same thing, verbalize. I am holding short of this runway. Okay, hey, I thought you said you're holding short. Oh, slam on the brakes. So by verbalizing your intentions, you're enlisting the other person or pilot to help you along the way. I'm, speak, I'm preaching to the choir here about educating because you guys are all here right now. You're trying to educate yourselves and learn more. So I don't even need to tell you that, but there are many WINGS programs. There's, there, I'm gonna be holding more of them. I'm new to this area. I've been given a lot of them and I plan on giving more here locally, both online and offline. Feel free to come to mind, but there are a lot of great uh, FAA safety team reps, Matt included of the air traffic control side. And there are a lot of programs, online programs. There's a lot of ways to educate yourself. I have a lot of lists and links on my website as well. Um, a good pilot in command is always ready to reject, to, to stop. On every flight review I give, the first takeoff or maybe the second one, I pop a door open at about 20, 30 knots just to see what will happen. Who would go under that? Would you keep going if the door popped open at 20 knots? <laughs> Who would keep going? Yeah, you say that here. But almost, I would say more than half, a greater percentage of those, they keep going. What happened? Door popped open. You're only 20 knots. Stop. Um, I'm working a case right now of a beach musketeer that uh, took off. Uh, not a musketeer. It was a beach Sierra out of Las Vegas. Uh, crashed the airplane to fly the door. Trying to get the door shut. Popped open after takeoff. And very unfortunate. The airplane will fly with the door open. Come back around and land and don't worry about the door. But in any event, be prepared to reject the takeoff. And as GA pilots, we generally are not. Or make a 180 and go back if you just don't like the way this is looking. It's not a sign of failure. It's a bragging right. If you ever come to me and say, hey, I didn't go flying this day. Or I went up, I got out to the runway and felt a gust of wind and decided, no, I'm going back to the hangar. That's a sign of courage, courage to do the right thing. And I will never make fun of anybody for, for, for changing the plan and doing that. And when in your... We are in doubt, don't. Uh, I, I had my spidey sense going off when I was asked to carry all that weight on a hot day out of a short field with mountains all around, hills all around, and my tail was tingling. What do I mean by tail tingling? Food out the wazoo. Well, you know, whatever kind of food comes out of a wazoo, I, I really don't think we're interested in eating. I don't know. The guy's making a lot of sense to me. I think we should listen. Well, yeah, I'm okay with wazoo food there. No, you're not. The tail is tingling. Oh, yeah. hold, on, hold, on, hold on, hold on. The what is what? When something doesn't feel right, my tail tingles. And let me tell you something. Everything you've said so far is driving my tail crazy. <laughs> so if your tail tingles, don't fly. You know, subliminally, your, your brain knows what's right and what's wrong. And so that quote I read you about anxiety, um, that's true. You've gotten yourself into something you probably shouldn't be in if you're already anxious. You, 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 your subliminal mind knows that what you're about to do is wrong. So listen to it. And you've heard this quote, right? Yeah. The second key that will keep you out of an accident is to operate at one of two speeds. You choose, okay? There are two speeds at which we can operate. So this is the second thing I brief. I brief my co-pilots, I brief my students, I brief another pilot if I'm flying with them. If you see me operating at number two, you're probably gonna see number two, <laughs> but we're rein me in. If I see you operating at that speed, I'll rein you in. There's never a reason to hurry in, in flying. We hurry, you see people doing their run-ups while they're taxiing out. You see people multitasking and there's just no need to do that. And so this is the second common denominator that I've seen in a lot of the accidents I've studied was a rush to comply with ATC, with passengers, with trying to beat weather out. Something put the pilot in a hurry. And when you hurry, you make mistakes. It's bad decision-making. I once was teaching a student in the simulator of the Boeing 727. 
that's a three engine airliner from years ago. You guys probably seen it in museums. Anyway, <laughs> I'm teaching in the simulator, go around. And the pilot's going through the go around process as fast as he can and screwing it up every time. Like you forget the gear, flaps, whatever, flaps, whatever. Uh, and I said, look, let's slow this down a notch. I timed him. I said, time me going really fast. And he timed me. Then I went painfully slow on the next go around. I said, all right, flaps 20, positive rate. 1,001, 1,002, sip of coffee, gear up. I mean, sometimes there's a one sip problem. Sometimes it's a two sip problem. Take your time. Set missed approach altitude. Tell the tower we've missed. I'm going through this painfully slow. And it was like two seconds different. It was like negligible. Go slow. Automation dependency. This is a big problem for now that we have better automation. We have better autopilots. We have better flight planning iPads, the, the Garmin's, the Avidines, everything that we've got. We've got so much automation. We need to manage that. <laughs> I'm going to stop it. I think you get the idea, right? I mean, if, has anybody ever gotten stuck on an escalator? Three days for me. I mean, one time I couldn't. No. I mean, so the air, the airplane is flying a heading. The autopilot is on. And I, I tweak the heading bug and the airplane won't turn. Are you doomed to fly that heading? No. <laughs> click it off, right? Click, click. Uh, there are many more extreme circumstances that require you when the autopilot is not doing the right thing or the automation is just not what you think it should be. Click, click, disconnect, grab a fistful of throttle and flight controls and fly that airplane. And that's what you should do. So be careful of automation dependency. We talked about declaring an emergency. Matt, if I declare an emergency, does that open up any to a toolbox for you? I mean, if, I, if, if I'm having a problem, and I say, no, nothing to see here, but I'd like to come in and land. Um, and I don't tell you about it, don't declare an emergency. I guess my question is, do you have more at your disposal to do for me to help me as a pilot if I declare an emergency? Probably. So yeah, uh, of course, you know, everyone likes throwing books out the window. Me, there it goes. Because you have a lot of things, procedures by which you must follow, I don't know, like the order of aircraft into an airport or whatever. It depends on who's flying. You know, if you're coming in, maybe you get a go around. Right, I get a go but, around. Uh, I mean, if you <laughs> so, so just call me, say, say something like what you would say on the radio and I'll tell you how I'll react. Well, I'd say, okay, I got a, a, a radio in up and I need to come in and land. So there'd be some laughing first off and then I would key up and, okay, put a land. Okay, but let's say it's a controller that uh, you know, they say, okay, well, you, you need to go out 10 mile downwind because you're number 17, I'll call your base. And, and, and you say that to me and I say, but I, I, I can't see that far, my GPS has failed. And I'm a little scared to go that far out from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> it can happen. I mean, it's just giving up, making up a scenario, but. So we laugh, uh, but I have experienced something very similar and that's why I laugh. Oh, really? Uh, it wasn't exactly that, but it was basically a pilot that forgot how to fly the airplane. So if you actually told me that on frequency, you know, my spidey sense, my tail would tingle and yeah. I'd be like, okay, this guy needs to be on the ground, not in the air. So, you know, it's, a radio failure, but you're still talking to me. You know, not the end of the world, but if you lose that second one, okay, well, you better know your light guns. Anyone know their light guns? Come on. Red is no, green is yes. Something like that. Okay, <laughs> study your light guns, people, especially your student pilots. Yeah, no, if if you don't know your light guns, see, that's, that was a good example. If your radios go out, both of them, and I'm flashing lights at you, are you gonna know what to do? Or are you just gonna be like, mm, do to do, I'm just gonna land. You know, I, I've had that happen too, but I would put you on the ground. I would just yeah. not even mess up. Just, all right, make left traffic. And you know, you're number 17, follow this guy. You got him in sight? Yeah. Follow that guy to clear land. 
And it's not fair because you're a pilot, you understand and, and can relate to this some more, but a, a controller who's not a pilot might say, I, I got all these airplanes and I don't know how I'm gonna get you in ahead of them. You need to go this far out. Well, a GPS, sometimes I had a friend have this happen, electrical failure, just alternator failed, batteries dying. And the first thing to go was the, the GNS 430. The radio was still working. They were still able to broadcast. So that might've been the next thing to go. And then now you have to know your light gun signals, which you don't. Now you've really got an emergency. And that that talks that talks more to being, you know, learning as a pilot, knowing what really is an emergency. Is a radio failure emergency? No, but if you lose your second one and then you have an electrical failure and then, you know, your Taco Bell's coming back and then, you, you know, all that stuff could add up and then there's an emergency right there. So if, if the word enters your head, should I declare an emergency? You probably should. And and you we, can, and yeah for for a radio failure okay there may be some laughing off frequency but you know again it's just get on the ground I've had I've had that happen one radio failed tower radio failed you know laughing ensues and then the second one failed and then their alternator failed then they had a complete electrical failure and I'm here with the green light <laughs> shining that at them uh, and they they're just coming down I'm shining that at them my arm's getting tired and they went around and I'm like okay so you know what's the What's the next one I do? Flashing green, which, which means what? Who knows what a flashing green for aircraft in the air means? To be followed by, Steady. there we go. So that guy went into, he did like two, three patterns and he's having electrical failure problems. You mean touch and goes? Yeah, well, no, he just went around every single time. Oh. Cause I, I don't know, I, I never talked to the guy. I, somebody else did, but I was flashing the light out in the whole How about time. my engines running rough? Roger, you're number 17, continue down when I'll call your base. That's a different story, right? I mean, <laughs> oh yeah. You, but uh, if you say I'm declaring an emergency, they're going to say clear to land, and then you fly the airplane to the runway. Then they will get everybody out of your way. Am I? Correct? That's theoretically correct. So it's a funny yeah. story that you. It's funny that you mentioned that. I had yeah. that happen the other day. I was training a kid. I call them all kids. We're all students. I'm training this dude, and uh, I had three Cherokees flying around, and the third one took off, and he's like, you know, tower got a rough running engine. My trainee who hasn't seen this type of thing, he's a former Air Force guy like me, so he's used to jets and stuff, and hees like, okay, and so of course, I stood up and I fixed it, you know, because I was training him, and i I ended up you know he said rough running engine, he didn't say emergency, he didn't say declare, he didn't say anything except rough running engine, so my trainee he messed up, and I just keyed up, what do you need? It's an emergency at this point, whether I ring the crash phone out or not. And the guy's like, yo, can we land this runway or can we land this runway? But we don't want to land on the wrong runway. You know, it's just, what are you worrying about that nonsense in that time? <laughs> Rough running engine, I'd be crapping my pants. I want to get to the ground. So I told him, I said, no, dude, you're clear to land this runway or this runway. And that's one of those things. I can't normally clear you to land on all the runways. That's one of the things I can't do as air traffic. But if you got a rough running engine, clear to land where you can find a spot, preferably the runway. Okay. No taxiways, but I, I cleared them. I said, hey, one seven or one six, clear to land, pick one. Hey, you go downwind for a few minutes, enjoy life. Hey, you do a 360, you can watch the show. Hey, you hold short, don't care. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I've heard these, oh, we need to get the park, we need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's an emergency too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> on you know, the ground rough, though. <laughs> rough running engine, first thing I might want to do is climb. I'm, I'm not going to stay at pattern altitude if I still got a ways to go. I'm, I'm going to get whatever altitude I can at the time and turn if I have to. I'm going to fly the airplane to the runway. I'm going to declare an emergency. If the closest runway, and I've had an emergency where landing downwind was the closest runway, but it was a very long runway. So I took it, said, declaring an emergency, I'm going on that runway. Uh, I also had smoke in the cabin, fire, and I flew above 250 knots below 10,000 feet. So declaring that emergency gets the FAA off your back for violating regulations. There are no regulations now because we said earlier and the, the regulation says that a pilot in command to the extent required to meet an emergency can do whatever they have to. They're, the rule's out the window. And that's what we're saying about- throwing, Same thing for controllers. Throwing the book out. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So don't hesitate and, and do not be afraid. Uh, we can have a talk on the, all the emergencies I've declared uh, and, and, and nothing has ever happened ever to me from, from all of the emergencies I've declared. What's more dangerous of these three choices? Who says driving a car? Who says flying an airplane? How about riding a bike? Yeah, I say it depends. 
where you are, what you're doing. I mean, flying an airplane is dangerous. We're, we're, we're led to believe it's the safest mode of transportation. Flying an airplane is dangerous. It's the lip in the concrete. There are hazards. It's as safe as the pilot. If you have a good attitude, you, you, you stay in the envelope, you don't hurry, you follow procedures, and you make good decisions, it's very safe, arguably safer than any mode of transportation. But there are pilots who get into airplanes. It's none of you. But the ones who, who crash airplanes are the ones who get into the airplane like you and I get into our car. We just get in and go. It's going to work. We take for granted. We're going to get there. The roads will be open. We don't care what the weather is. We don't care the oil in the car. A light will come on and tell me. We can pull over if we have to. Do not get into an airplane like you get into a car. Many pilots do, and those are the ones that crash airplanes. <clears throat> Bob Hoover said it really well. So the risk has to be worth the reward many times. Uh, getting out of bed involves risk, especially for me. So, so you know, sometimes if you don't want to avoid any risk, you could stay in bed all day long, right? And not expose yourself to any of the risk. But you're hungry, you want to live, you want to enjoy your life, you got to earn money, you got to go to work. There are things that you have to do. So you have to expose yourself to that risk. And we do what we have to do to mitigate that risk. So we always accept a certain amount of risk. And Bob Hoover said it really well. Sometimes stuff happens. And there's something about risk taking that uh, you don't think anything's going to ever happen to you. It just only happens to other people. You like to think that I'm smarter than the airplane is and I'll know how to handle whatever situation comes my way. That isn't always the case. If you have a malfunction at the wrong place at the wrong time, you're dead. And sometimes that's true. There are some airports where if you lose your engine shortly after liftoff, you, it's just, you're going to have to crash it the best you can. And there are risky airports. One of them is Catalina Airport out on the West Coast, airport in the sky. There's nowhere to go. It's on top of a mountaintop. But we accept that risk because they got great burgers at the restaurant there, Buffalo burgers. So it's worth it. <clears throat> Here's a little exercise on risk. Has anybody heard of the plank exercise? Yeah? All right, don't tell, don't tell the secret. So if I offered you $20 and I put this plank, a two by 12, you know, two inches thick, 12 inches wide, and it's like 20 feet long, and I put it on the floor right here, and who would walk across it if I gave you 20 bucks to do it? Most everybody, yeah, I would do it too. How about we take two of these desks, we put them 20 feet apart, and we put that plank across those two desks, and I'm gonna give you 20 bucks to walk across that. Who would do that? Yeah, you, you guys are cheap. You really take the 20 bucks, you're thinking about what you could do with that. How about two two-story houses, okay? And, and they're close enough together that we're gonna put that plank between chimney to chimney. Who would do that? For 20 bucks, I'll give you 20 bucks. Would you walk across that? Of the 100, do I, do I hear 50 bucks maybe? <laughs> 10, <laughs> okay. How about, the, remember the old World Trade Centers, the two towers? Let's say we put that board across those two buildings, if they were still there, God rest their soul. Would you do that for 20 bucks? That risk is not, what if one of those buildings behind you, the one you're standing on, is on fire? Then would you do it? You don't have a parachute. <laughs> risk versus reward. What's the reward? Well, the reward in doing it 120 stories high, if that building's on fire, I get to live. But twenty dollars not worth the risk. <laughs> Am I still going to pay you if you if the other building's on? Yeah, yes, I'd still pay you. You get to live and you get twenty bucks. <laughs> exactly. So the risk has to be worth worth what you're taking. Uh, the pilot controller relationship. Well, what does ATC stand for? Air traffic control. It's that. Third letter, the control word that kind of gets a lot of people hung up on the voices in their ear and, 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 and they feel like ATC is godlike, right? I mean, you got them right here, you know, clear to land, clear for takeoff. And it's, uh, you know, what they tell me, I have to do it, right? Well, it, a lot, you know, a lot of us feel like that when we first start, start learning to fly and ATC is, what's their job? To help, yeah, they're to safe and orderly flow of traffic and sequence you into an airport, and and they're there for us. If there were no airplanes, would we need controllers? I'm I'm not beating up on you, because you're a pilot, so that's okay. I'd still go fly. No pilots, would we need controllers? If there were no controllers, would we need pilots? 
a little different. But in any event, they're not there to control. We heard in that video that why didn't ATC bring that airplane in for a landing sooner? Because they're not flying the airplane, right? You're flying the airplane. So it should be like air traffic service. They, they do provide a service. Now they do give some control for IFR aircraft and they separate IFR aircraft. The tower, do they separate aircraft? Who thinks the tower gives you separation? Control tower at a towered airport, class D airspace. Do they separate aircraft? Do they have any parameters for how far away those airplanes have to be, like a radar controller does? I see a no back there. So you, you get a four flight uh, tag, we'll give it to you. Um, no, a tower, really, their jurisdiction is where for a tower controller for separating aircraft? Like your thing says on the runway. Yeah, and they use what to do that? Landmarks? No, I mean like the window or the radar. Oh, the window. Yeah. Window. So you have a repeater in the tower. Who's aware of the fact that they have like a radar repeater in the control tower? You've been up there, you've seen that. Is that something that you use to separate aircraft? Nope. Are you a radar controller? No. Nope. No. There's a difference between a tower controller and approach controller or center controller, a radar controller. So you use that as a tool to help you spot aircraft inbound or sequence aircraft. It's a tool, right? But it's, it's not but used it's not. for separating. Nope. Have you ever been told to fly running, you know, certain heading? You maybe stay upwind a little bit more, extend your upwind because they're sequencing. But I think the tower basically sequences for the runway and separates them on the runway, like clear to land and clear to take off, go around, line up and wait. Those are all for, for spacing on the runway, right? And very limited IFR. Limited. Separation. So like if I've got two jets going, two, yeah. increase, two miles increasing the three. Okay. So like if I launch a King Air, then a Cherokee, and I got to have my two to start, and then three, I have to, I can't bust that kind of separation. Okay. But, that, but that's not, you know, yeah. that's not the primary use of the tower. Right. I mean, if you're told to, you know, make left downwind, follow the Cherokee on downwind, they never tell you how far to stay behind, right? Have you ever thought about how close can I get to that Cherokee? How close would you would you say something if they got too close? A I good mean, show for me. There are no parameters, and that's what I'm getting at. Don't hit it. Most pilots the have tower controllers do not separate you. They do not. They will. I mean, he's going to make every effort to keep two airplanes from hitting each other. But when you're in the pattern, it's up to you. When you're VFR, it's up to you. Here's another question. So. Uh, Ground control they do on the taxiways, they use the window for that. Tracon and, and, and uh, the center, air traffic control center, use radar. They don't even have windows, right? They're down in a basement or dark room with nothing but radar. They have parameters. They cannot let two IFR aircraft get closer together than whatever. Three miles. Three miles. Or five in certain scenarios. Or five in certain scenarios. So there are parameters there, but what about IFR and VFR? Don't hit. Don't hit. So as you're a VFR traffic, don't think that just because that guy's IFR is gonna be separated from you, he's not. It's still CNBC. If you're IFR and you're flying, like when I'm coming into DFW and I'm above 10 and there's a 414 cruising at 11.5 and I'm above the class Bravo, scariest thing in the world for me is a VFR day, VMC day, when I'm flying IFR you know, in, in the DFW or something like that because it's on me the IFR pilot to see VFR aircraft if I'm not in the clouds. If you're in the clouds, well, as we know, VFR aircraft are not allowed in the clouds. So it's IFR and IFR, ATC will separate. Just keep in mind that ATC does not separate VFR from IFR, unless you're in cl inside class Bravo or sometimes in Charlie airspace. Just keep that in mind. It's an important fact. <laughs> yeah. We've, it's pilot in command. So don't be obediently dead. Don't follow ATC. Be very, very willing to use my favorite word, unable, or student pilot. I said that going into Houston one time in, in an MD-80, going into Intercontinental, and they wanted, they gave me this clearance. It was really taxi clearance. It was complex. Anybody been down there? Like the taxiways have two, two letters. Bravo, Bravo, no, November, November. November, Bravo, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, student pilot request for progressive. <laughs> and controller just started laughing. I'm like, serious, I can't do that. I'm not, I don't even want to trust myself with that clearance. Give me a progressive. Uh, airline pilots will do that too. Professional pilots will do that. It's a tool that you can use. Uh, don't hesitate to say, yeah, I'm unable. If you're, 
flying in somewhere, they say, extend your downwind and there's mountains in front of you. And they say, I want you to continue downwind. I'll call your base, but I also don't want you to climb. <laughs> Unable. If you're flying IFR and they say maintain present heading and you see that in front of you, unable, you're not going to fly into it. It's just to declare an emergency and say no if you have to. The first time I ever saw an emergency declare, I know we're running a little long tonight, but just 18 more stories, three more hours, we'll be out of here. First time I saw, and this is very important, my dad was a pilot. He taught me how to fly. We're on a family vacation and we're coming back from a national park in an airplane, flying back to home. And there was a restricted area off to the left and thunderstorms off to the right. And these were building unforecast thunderstorms building up over the desert. And he's, he says, yeah, we, we need to go left. We're getting VFR flight following at the time. And they said, yeah, unable, there's restricted airspace. And so he's, they said, are you IFR equipped and qualified? And he said, yes, but I'm not taking a clearance into those clouds. They look like cauliflower, not like cotton. They look like cauliflower and they're building and these thunderstorms are building fast. And so he said, no. And they said, well, uh, say your intentions. And behind us, they're building as well. So he said, I'm going to squawk 7,700, clearing an emergency, and I'm turning left into the restricted airspace. Airplane doesn't know it's in restricted airspace, does it? Flies just fine in there. Plus, you get a really cool air show. We were intercepted by something that had to fly really steep angle of attack just to fly right next to it. <clears throat> it was really cool. Nothing ever became of it except it was a safe flight. If you have the choice to go into restricted airspace or VFR and IMC, always take the restricted airspace all day long, every day. Do not go into IMC unplanned. So there's too many of us to play this game. So I'm gonna, and to save time, I'm gonna go past this, but here's the important advice. There should be a captain in there somewhere. Right? There should be a captain in the airplane somewhere. BPIC. Um, mistakes. We all make mistakes. Who has never made a mistake? That's right, yeah. Well, there's always one, yeah. Just, I like it, I like it, because she knew it. But anyway, we all make mistakes, and the worst ones are the ones we just don't learn from. So we all make them, learn from them, evaluate it. Talk to someone, talk to other pilots, talk to an instructor, say, here's something that happened, make a lesson out of it, try to learn from it. So the key takeaways here, so this is it. This is why you came tonight, is to get how do I, what is our goal when we fly an airplane? Besides having fun, what's the goal? And what is, what's the result of being safe? Alive, don't crash. Our goal is not to crash an airplane. I, I'm being brutally straight with you, but it's, that's the, the idea, is we don't wanna crash the airplane. We wanna have fun and we wanna be safe. We don't wanna crash. If you do these things, you are probably 99% not going to crash an airplane. First one, keep learning. Again, preaching to the choir because you guys are here. Two, manage external pressures. They're huge. They'll keep coming at you. It's like a, a video game. They're just gonna keep coming at you. They're meant to, that's life. You're gonna have external pressures. You're gonna have a reason to go flying when you think there's a reason not to. Stay inside the envelope, okay? Mind your limitations of the aircraft, your personal limitations, the FARs, the AIM, any insurance requirements or a, a renter's agreement or the school here. Is anybody learning here at the school? A few of you, they probably have some rules that are a little bit more stringent than the, the regs, right? Yeah, there's a reason for that. Mind them like they're solid. Again, two speeds. Operate at the slower speed. There's never a reason to rush. And five, manage risk. If you see something that's just too risky and you can't mitigate that risk and it's not justifiable, don't do it. Now, of these five, there are two if you want to ignore three of them, don't ignore these two, okay? These two are the common denominator in almost every accident. We could sit here and study accidents and see that somewhere this got violated, one of these two. Look at the Avianca we just saw, okay? Were one of these two violated? I don't think you were in a hurry. Probably should have been. The only time to be in a hurry is like when you're in the air and on fire, right? I mean, maybe that's a time to act quickly, but... No, inside the envelope, he had reserve fuel, right? Is that reserve fuel meant for holding for destination? No, it's meant for going to your alternate and they should have done that. So that rule was violated there. 
In any event, that's all I've got. Be aggressively safe. Be proud of your decisions. I'll hang around if you guys want to talk about anything, ask any questions, and, and or pick up a four-flight uh, lanyard thing here for your zippers. In any event, there's my info. Thank you for coming. Keep coming. I'll have more.